Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name is Ryan, and with me again, another dope indie creator spotlight episode for you guys. Today, I'm talking to Jason Lapidus, another fellow member of the KFAB Ringside Seats group. You guys have been watching, you know, the past few weeks, and there's going to be many weeks to come where we talk to indie uh, cartoonists. So, welcome, Jason. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Yeah, dude, it's it's a pleasure to talk to be able to talk comics with you, man. Like, you know, we've been talking before. Uh, this interview start a little bit, so kind of, kind of, kind of break the ice a little bit, you know, get to know each other a little bit. So um, I'm excited to talk about how how your love of comics started. Um, so I'd love to hear your story, and then from being a fan to doing uh, comic books professionally. For sure, um, like a lot of people, my my road into comics was through uh, television and loving superheroes on TV. So I mean, this is where it ages. Again, I was watching this stuff in syndication, but Batman 66 on television as a kid, Super Friends, Spider-Man 67, I think that's the year that that show was done. So those, and you know, Wonder Woman and Incredible Hulk, like those kinds of things on TV when I was really little, that it just, I was interested in superheroes automatically, no problem. And uh, it just took a number of years before it came across comics in the wild, you know, in the magazine rack at my dentist office or something like that, or... Uh, in the spinner rack at the at the convenience sco- at the convenience store, my first comic that I, m- I remember buying was GI Joe number nineteen, and uh, you know I'm I'm part of that early '80s toy boom, uh, you know that falls out of out of Star Wars, so those action figures in the early '80s it, it hit man like the those commercials were a big deal and getting those little objects in my hand was something really special to me, and so the GI Joe when I saw like okay there's a, a cartoon action figures, comic book, all together. I wanted all three things somehow in my life. And yeah, G.I. Joe 19, and then it was just a matter of, okay, now I love I love the object. I love reading this. I love consuming this format. And I just began collecting from there and went from, you know, G.I. Joe to, I guess, Alpha Flight. <laughs> Alpha Flight, I started reading, not knowing it was a Canadian <laughs> book. I had no idea that, let me rephrase that. I, I, don't, I don't go by that idea that it's a Canadian book, by the way, because it wasn't produced in Canada by Canadians. Uh, it was an American book about Canadians made mm-hmm. by John Byrne, who sometimes calls himself Canadian. Sometimes he calls himself a Brit transplant to Canada, transplant to the States. So he, his, uh, you know, it, the book was like more tokenistically Canadian, but I didn't know that going into reading it. And then I went on to, once I realized they were connected to X-Men, I'm like, okay, X-Men. As Marvel's 25th anniversary hit, they started putting out like Marvel Universe, the, the big compendium, the handbook of all the characters right. and the Marvel saga which was like a 25 issue recap of the Marvel universe in narrative and sequence in chronological oh, wow. order. That's dope. And so I was like, Oh, tell me, every, I want the encyclopedia. I want to know what happened here. Why are all the things the way they are? So I was reading, you know, Kirby panels because they would take panels from specific key stories and put them in chronological order to just talk you through. Really it was Marvel grand design before that was a thing. And the, yeah, again, the panels are all reprinted, so there's no art cohesion. There's no even nice panel alignment because they're cropping and changing sizes, and it, it is like a hodgepodge, and uh, it's kind of hilarious. But man, those issues are some of my most well loved comics. So from there, I became like at school, I was the kid who knew who every character was. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Marvel Universe put uh, Marvel Comics put out this um, massive poster at the end of the '80s that had every single Marvel character in, in basically an alphabetical order. And he had a challenge in, in Marvel age in their like uh, monthly recap book and uh, like periodical article book, where if you can name every character on it, like, you know, you could win something. Well, I can name every character on it. Holy I could do it in okay. alphabetical order. It was like every, every single character I was, I was dialed in. So that was sort of my, my way into reading. And eventually, you know, adolescence takes over. I kind of found my way out of collecting the road to, Making comics was, I always thought in all those years that I was going to be an artist at Marvel. Like I was pretty convinced as a kid, like that's what I want. And so I pursued learning the fine arts, you know, drawing and painting. And eventually, you know, went to art school after high school and proceeded to drop out and just get kind of sucked into the work world. And I started working at, at 19, 20 years old. And that was it. I was just like working every day at, at a, a great museum in Toronto. And I just sort of lost the direction of wanting to pursue comics as a, as a career until 
I, I met a friend of mine and my friend Chris Sanigan, we met through our, our now wives. They were, they were friends at university. And Chris and I uh, always just joked around about all sorts of things, music and, and action movies and comics and whatnot. And one day he just sort of pitched me an idea. He's like, would you like to, if you want to do a project together? Would you, I know you draw. Do you want to like make a comic book and see if we can do this? And I really loved the pitch. It was something that, that pulled me out of my seat and I couldn't say no. And we decided to take the plunge and try to make comics. And, you know, the, we really enjoyed the, the process of uh, figuring out what the book was going to be and, and what the characters were going to look like and how it was going to go. And one issue turned into two, and turned into six. And I just finished making seven. And, uh, you know, it's been now four years of releasing comics and about a five and a half, six year kind of journey from the beginning of that to, to where we are now. And now it's like, I honestly can't imagine a day where I'm not doing something to make comics. It doesn't make sense to me that I'm not making comics in some capacity. So that's sort of the, the, the condensed condense. version, but there's a huge gap, you know, like from, let's just say 1994 to, uh 2016 like there's a gap where i was not really moving too far forward i would doodle a lot like you know um ed and jim just covered that batman the batman animated series art book on this show the other day and like when i got hold of that in at the end of the 90s i learned about blue line and i'm like okay i'm gonna draw poses of batman standing there i'm gonna start with blue line and i'm gonna do ink and i'm gonna learn those things but i wasn't doing sequential i was just drawing to you know, just for pleasure as a hobby, you know, while you watch a movie or whatever it was, but it wasn't, I didn't really understand the difference between drawing and what it would take to draw comics and draw sequential. That's yeah. that, dude, that Batman book. I am so jealous that anybody that has it. Cause like I, he even says it at the beginning of the episode, there's some copies on eBay for 60 bucks that they're probably not 60 anymore. Yeah. They weren't 60 anymore. And I'm yeah. awake the minute their videos drop. Like I wake up every morning, 5.45, my time. And yeah. 6 a.m. is when the videos drop. I don't I don't click them before I go on normally. Normally I'll just go straight to eBay and I'll check to see or mycomicshop.com or whatever, right? And the ship was already fucking like 200 bucks. I'm like, I can't afford that right now. But that that show was hugely influential to me as a as a kid because I five, I think it was five when when that cartoon dropped. And that's right when I started getting comic books. And I think that's why Batman always was like a really a huge favorite of mine. I think that's still my favorite version of Batman. I don't think it's think it's ever been topped in my mind. Like there's the only thing that I like as much as that would be Long Halloween by Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale. Or like, you know, obviously Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One, right? Like those are like the perennials to me. Yeah, it's interesting. I you know I didn't even think about that. That it was probably TV. That got yeah, for sure. Comics. I like that's. I just realized it. Like it didn't. It didn't compete with me before. I just thought, oh, my mom got me this issue of Flash when I was a kid, and that was my first comic. So that's how I got in. But it had to have been the animated series. But that show is also for. I mean, when it came out, I was seventeen, and it was like, okay, I'm. I have long hair, and I'm a high school student, and I'm not collecting action figures or reading. I was reading comics still a little bit. Uh, but I was okay. I'm setting the timer on my on my video cassette recorder. I'm I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm getting home from school from high school. You know, girlfriend on the arm, and I'm like, we're gonna sit down and watch this cartoon now for children. You know, yeah. like that. It 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 was such a, a great show from the top, like right from the first episode that aired. It was solid, and you knew it was something special. And whether you're five or seventeen. Uh, we all knew that that was that was the real deal, and you're right. There really hasn't been a version um, that really tops that. Kevin Conroy, you know Bruce Timm, Paul Dini, Batman. He he's perfect in just about every way, and mm -hmm. it's funny, you know. Like I think we can probably make the case that The Dark Knight Returns, I don't know, it is a, a greater contribution. I don't know, maybe you can't make that argument, but it it is like such a significant contribution. But it almost feels like it's too far because it goes way past mm -hmm. where where the animated series Batman would go. Like it's, right. it's him in an else world, but like, I want him here. I want him to be like that version. Yeah. Um, his ending, you know, Bruce Wayne's ending in the animated version feels more like what my Batman would do than go and be Frank Miller's ending. Yeah. You know? No, I agree. Um, yeah. 
that show is yeah it's fantastic it's, so, it's yeah. flawless it's flawless man and like i still like if i see batman in other mediums or well like film or other shows i, st- I, I in my head i still hear kevin conroy like i don't as you should I don't really hear <laughs> the voices that are on the screen like to me i'm like no nah, it don't sound right you know like it just it's embedded in my mind so like yeah i think it's there's a reason why that show's so celebrated and it like you said it is for kids but it was it was also for older older audiences because there was a yeah. lot of themes in the show and it wasn't dumbed down for kids i feel you know what i mean no like, i don't think so either I, well i mean there are moments where they'll they'll make sure they use a character's name a bunch of times where you don't necessarily need it in in real life you wouldn't keep calling people ryan at the end of every sentence well true. ryan you know what yeah. i think ryan you know, like yeah, there, there that, are those things but I, I don't i don't think of it as being a kid show i think of it as being a, a show that was made for kids to be enjoyed by all right you know I, there, I mean there was no doubt that it was targeting children in certain ways especially with the, the marketing point of view but those guys wanted to make a show that they liked yeah right and uh, i think that's sort of the, the key to all those kid properties um that if you're making it uh with toward children or toward that um that demographic but you want to make sure you like it too you're going to be in a, a safer spot like pixar seems to thread that needle with no problem as far as big franchises you know marvel hits their i think hits their like 10 to 13 year old demographic really well with everything and i love what they do like i love every marvel movie mm-hmm. so i think you know but so do my kids yeah um star wars yeah seems to sometimes get it sometimes this way sometimes that way it, but i think that's you know you can do a brand for all you can you can have a brand that has something for uh, an adult and then has a different thing for a kid and that I agree. it's cool too but anyway yeah. batman in series yeah amazing you got to get that book um I hopefully know. you'll find it you'll find it maybe secondhand but in good condition at a cheap yeah. price where someone has overlooked it and undervalued it but it yeah. is uh it's a beautiful object. It's really great to look through and it will, it'll change your life. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm not an artist, but I can appreciate art. You know what I mean? Like for as long as I, yeah. like, I mean, I've been reading comics. I never stopped. So, so for the moment I got that first comic when I was five years old to now, like comics have always been in my life. And yeah, you know, I do want to ask though, you know, before we jump into like the work you're doing now, what, brought you back into comics like so did you not read comic books from that whole from uncanny x-men 268 <laughs> until 2016 was there no comic book reading or no there totally was comic book reading okay i really didn't, right. i didn't stop what i really did was i took a break and stopped collecting monthlies i think that it was a combination of like running out of money um mm-hmm. seeing titles go from you know, I'm collecting like one Spider-Man. Now there's like all of a sudden there's a new Spider-Man book popping up. There's a new X-Men book popping up. Everything would see, there seemed to be you know, multiple covers and just that, that like what happened in the industry happened in me too, which was there was that expansion and then eventually it reached breaking point and collapsed. And I got out as I started to feel the expansion. It expanded past my boundaries early on mm-hmm. uh, from my threshold as a consumer. I just couldn't keep up. Um, even like hardcore titles I was collecting like G.I. Joe, had gone from two titles, you know, they were all of a sudden they're producing a digest and they're producing tales of GI Joe and they're producing these multi, uh, you know, GI Joe Europe. And like, I, I just couldn't keep up anymore with how many things I needed to buy in a month. And, um, and then also the interest in other things like, like music and girls and all that kind of stuff in high school. But once I decided to stop reading, let's just say uh, maybe in the early nineties, uh, I took maybe a few years where um, I think the graphic novel and the trade paperback started to proliferate in bookstores and get in the hands of friends who then were sharing. So I, I missed Marvels when it happened, mm-hmm. but I got, I got Kingdom Come. Like, you know, I missed when Batman's back was broken in, in the monthly, but when Nightfall, the trade hit, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to read this. So that kind of got me back into at least finding trades and then buying trades so I only kind of missed maybe about five years of reading, but man, so much happened. Like image comics happened in that gap. Right. So I, I just got my copies of Savage Dragon last year, like the, the beginning of it. I just got uh, like Wildcats number one from Craig CK. 
uh, you know, a couple of months, a month ago, like I'm just getting those things in my hands now. And, you know, again, I, I'm not a 13 year old kid, so they don't, they don't hit the same way that they're, that they would now. It's more like I have this artifact of the industry. Like I have, it's, it's like looking through the photo album of the, the family of comics and I have, Oh, I can put this photo in the history of, so I love having those things. Yeah. Um, it's really neat to see, but yeah, I missed the complete, the, the first wave of image stuff. I missed it completely. Miss Superman with long hair. Thank goodness. You didn't miss much. <laughs> yeah, you didn't miss much. Right. Well, I missed the, the boom and then the bust. And what came out afterward was something that suited me more. So reading the trade, yeah, it hit me in a great way. So I never really stopped collecting. It just went from being long box to bookshelf. And it just happened in the right kind of flow with, with my age. Now I have both in in ridiculous abundance so. yeah, I, yeah you're telling me i think I, like on the last uh symposium for the ringside seats like craig ck like he talked about how getting rid of long boxes right like the freedom i know i know getting in jerome getting rid of it right and i'm like fuck like part of part of me like i'm like i got too much and i well there was part partially i have too much that I don't care about, that I just, right. I, it's gone. I, it can leave and I would never ha- give it a second thought, right? And then the pandemic, like not working. So I'm like, I'm just gonna sell some of this shit, you know? And luckily some of the stuff that I didn't really care about, you know, $20 book, $30 book. I'm like, oh, this is dope. Like I'll just get rid of this shit. <laughs> yeah, to look at it again. But then fucking Cartoonist Kayfabe channel and the fucking ringside seats. Oh, look at this dope book. So then all I did was I replaced the shit I didn't care about. And it just, an influx of new stuff has, has kind of taken the spot. But, you know, I constantly battle, like, do I need to have single issues? Can I just get trades? But then my trades are out of control too. Like, I mean, I tell people that come into the shop I work at, I'm like, you see this section of graphic novels? I have twice that at my house, you know, like, <laughs> so, so don't tell me you have too much to read. I have, the, you, you see this? long line of the, on the show that that's my to read pile that i just keep bringing home books that i haven't even finished the last one you know so yeah. um i can it, relate yeah it's 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 a never ending uh never ending cycle but i mean i also wouldn't have it any other way you know like same it is it brings such joy and uh yeah the, the medium is it really just is the best medium out there you yeah. know it's the beautiful hybrid of a few different worlds colliding and it is is nothing better than, than reading good comics. The the trouble is now a uh, combination of things is as my taste is changing and I don't want to use the word refining, but it's becoming more specific. Yep. And my buying power has increased. And as my eyesight is declining, I like the bigger, I, I've got my hands on a couple artist editions, a couple. Yeah. Oh, and the artisan editions I, I adore because they're manageable, but I would rather spend now, let's just say like 45, 50 bucks in an artisan edition than reading a trade or four trades. And, and uh, they are, you know, my, my problem is that I get the discount. So right. I justify it with that. I'm like, well, you know, I'm not paying retail, so right. I can buy that. <laughs> I have, yeah, I think I bought, I got the Jaime Hernandez Studio Edition. I got the Ed Piscor Studio Edition. Oh, I think, no, I think I just have those two. And then I I got the Spawn, Todd McFarland, that's out of print, that a comic book industry guy brought in. He traded it into, or he just gave it to the shop. And I'm like, so I looked at my manager. I was like, yo, what's up, dude? Let me, let me, uh, let me buy that. So luckily he didn't charge me eBay price. He's like, I'll just charge you. You're not getting a discount, but you'll get it at cover. So yeah. I think I have, I don't know. I just, I have a problem. I just, it's, <laughs> you know, like, and I love hard covers. So yeah. I'll have legal issues because I want to support the book, especially like, you know, like criminal or whatever at Brubaker. Right? And then I'll go buy all those hard covers. In hand, like I'm, I'm reading this right now for the first time. I don't know how I missed it. But uh, yeah, Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, all that stuff. I love that they've switched their model this year to, we're just doing the hardcover. We're just going to do three a year. Like, I know. Love I'm it. Waiting, I'm waiting, like, because I just talked to him for the first book. 
So I want to I want to wait till like the third one so that I have a little bit more like there's more meat on the bones. You know what I mean? For me to talk to him about. I feel like I just talked to him like three months ago. Like I kind of want to have more to talk to him about than just like, oh, so in this book you did this. You know, like I don't want to sure. be talking about one book, you know, um, but I love them. So. Well, you know, his his career it has just been uh, it's been awesome to watch. Like I love he's one of the only writers that I follow. Does that make sense? I'm I'm more on I mean, the, the I mean the cartoonist or artist side. I mean uh, I'm 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 similar. I kind of I don't really follow characters. Like if I like a character and the book starts to suck, I'll drop that book like a bad habit. You know what I mean? Like I won't even hesitate. But yeah, I like Edward Baker's my favorite writer. I I, I can see why. I, there's nobody like I mean there's probably people that are close, but it's gonna take a lot to knock him off that top spot to me because every time they put out a book. It's my favorite book for like that amount of time until the next one drops. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. I want to go back and and fill in the gaps in in my Brew Baker collection for sure. And I can't wait to read their Parker the end end piece or ending or whatever they're going to call um, their contribution to the Parker series. I can't wait to see what they do. And we all know that like it can't it can't replace you know what Cook would have done. But I'm so glad that they're kind of breaking that ice a little bit where we're, we're, you know, I think a lot of people really revere Cook's work, myself included, and revere the Parker series. And then when you hold it in too high esteem, like it starts to take on a life of its own, but sometimes you got to chip away at it a little bit and make mm -hmm. it real again. Like, Oh, the character is more important than Cook from, from a creative point of view. Yeah. You know, a care, a character becomes immortal when more than one creator works on the character. Agreed. And yeah. I think we all want the, you know, the best things for those books is for Parker to become greater than the tragedy of losing Darwin Cook too early. Like, it, you know, the, we, yeah. I think Cook, Cook would want that too. Like he would want people not to be stuck on talking about how he's gone when they're reading his books. Yeah. So I think having Brew Baker and Phillips, like that's a great tandem to who, have. Who else, to who, else come in. Do you, who else do you have to do it? You know what I mean? Um, like they, I think they're, they're a good, cause like they have the crime noir genre. They do. On lockdown. You know what I mean? Like there are new, new things coming out, which, um, you know, as of the time we're recording this, uh, this week, the good Asian drops and that's set in like uh, Chinatown in the thirties uh, in San Francisco. And let me tell you, an awesome book dude like I bet. really really good and it's nice to have the, the, that genre like expand because like it's probably one of my favorites next to like a slice of life it is my favorite genre you know so yeah i'm excited for that martini edition with, with right that. martini edition uh did you read november oh yeah yeah, yeah. what am i talking about I read all so those are those are really good too i you know Elsa Chartier could have easily done a story in that book too. I agree. And, and uh, I would love it if, if her and Matt Fraction or whatever the tandem is going to be, I would love it if they, if they worked on it. And I would also love to see her flex um, in like to not ape cook. Like or not to feel that she has to, because she can do so much from a, a graphic design and a, an illustrative point of view. And she can she could ape cook if she wants to. She has you know the chops to do it, and it's part of her aesthetic. Like your line work is is kind of similar enough to to reference him. But I would love it if she like okay, let's do it her own way, and her and Matt Fraction or whoever she's going to work with um, took a stab at it too. I'm sure she's drawn Parker somewhere. I mean, I dude, you. she's. I told her I, I talked to her a while back, and I was like, dude, you're like David Mazzucchi and Darwin Cook, like like mixed into one like that's like yeah. that's the aesthetic that i got from november the first i think i yeah when i talked to her only book one was out because the pandemic fucking happened and we didn't get two through four um but yeah that's a great series anybody listening or watching definitely uh check out november but let's talk about your stuff <laughs> we have now been talking probably for a half an hour and we haven't even, <laughs> haven't even jumped into your stuff you know i was talking about like discovering new stuff thanks to the group thanks to the kayfabe channel and you are one of the creators that i've discovered because of the group right like i think well first of all craig ck gave you a shout out when i talked to him that was that was number one number two was like the image grand design book and me really like 
even though I don't necessarily always interact much with the group, like I'll, I'll put up interviews, I'll put up videos like to share with you guys, I'll ask questions like if I want some recs or I'll come do a little bit of comments, but I've really been just scouring for new stuff because like a lot of the stuff like um, creators like yourself are putting out like self-published stuff is getting me more excited than some of the stuff I'm seeing at the shop, right? Like I'm kind of getting burned out on constantly. It's like, I mean, I'll always read Marvel and DC, but at the same time, it's like, how often do these titles really push the envelope? It's rare oh. when it happens. Oh yeah. Every once in a while, you'll get a beta ray built by Daniel Warren Johnson, you know, you know that, but that's rare. We don't get stuff like that that often, man. So I'm really excited about the stuff you got, everybody's doing in the group. Me too. The passion, the energy, it's just, it's 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 like it's like it comes off in waves when I get stuff from you guys. The books that I'm reading. So like, let's talk group of seven. I wanna I wanna hear a little about it. I I love the book. It's dope. Oh, it's, good. You guys did it over the course of three years, right? We yeah, we put it over three years. We broke with uh, that idea of like, okay, we wanted to make a graphic novel, but we put it out in six issues, which is like against a kind of a bit of a code that a lot of people have and I totally get it. And our attitude was, we, we don't know if we can make a graphic novel and we have a six part story to tell. So we're gonna try and put out the first chapter and we'll see what we can get. And we know that the end goal is to get the book done, but maybe we can build a brand, make like learn about the industries that are involved in comic books and the communities that are established in our region and you know across the continent, not knowing of course a pandemic was coming, so we, we thought if we put out issue by issue, it gives us the advantage of, of time to sort of improve as we go. And like I said, learn, learn about the different elements that go into uh, the, the comic book world. So by the time the trade comes out, we kind of know where this goes. We kind of know its place on the bookshelf or on anyone's bookshelf. And uh, we get to meet many of the, the people involved over the, the few years it would take to make it. And we also, again, going from a place of not having made a single page of finished sequential art and you're, okay, I'm going to make 156 pages or whatever the number was going to be at the beginning. Um, I, I didn't know how I was going to get to the end of, of that story. So um, taking on 100 and a half pages is like, is more than I could manage uh, emotionally at the beginning. So like, okay, 24, let's handle 24 pages. We'll go from there and bit by bit. So we also love the floppy. As, a, as an object. So it, it didn't seem like too hard to sell to like, let's break it up. But uh, ethically, if you're gonna tell a story that I think is, you know, 132 pages and you know it's 132 pages, I, I kind of prefer the Brubaker Phillips model, like put out a graphic novel, mm -hmm. if you can. But for an indie creator, no rules. We're competing against a market of pros. And I, I think you just do whatever you got to do and, and people should have a little grace, give you a little grace and let you do whatever you want. So yeah, we made that comic and uh, it is an action adventure story featuring seven famous Canadian historic figures on a fictional mission to save the world. And I, uh, I love that idea when my friend Chris pitched it to me, he's an archivist and I was you know, an art teacher and it was like, okay, we both love Canadiana. We love like the things that separate make Canada kind of regional compared to all, all the American media that we consume. There are these little idiosyncrasies and, and these characters that are in Canadian history that just we don't get told about them from the amount of you know, American media we consume and, and European. So we love those Canadian things. We love them form of comic books. Chris wrote all these little things that sprinkle in moments in history. Uh, and it was just so much fun to do an, a punch em up action adventure story in the vein of, you know, like. League of Our Extraordinary Gentlemen meets Expendables meets a Canadian history class. So, no. it was, you know, like we're both history geeks. So we, we just thought it was so funny to take these characters that are real people and play with them in, on this, in this mission. Chris was, you know, leading up to, uh, you know, Canada, just to give you just a, a, a context here, the First World War means more to Canadians than it seems to, to Americans from a grand picture of looking at what stories get told. Mm -hmm. Not about an individual, not about what an individual values, I'm not criticizing anything like that. But there are more times that Canadians seem to culturally speak to the First World War um, as a nation than the Americans seem to. The Americans, you guys, 
the the second world war is is the story that seems to be told the most coming out of uh coming right. out of our, our neighbors to the south canada was pulled into both wars because of their you know connection to great britain and british empire and their like loyalty to that empire and canada was a new country as of you know 1867 so it's like pretty young going into world war one just decades later and it was the first time like the identity of the country was kind of called upon to unify and go do something. And it is, uh, it really shaped the landscape of Canadian culture, that war. So it was something that, that Chris and I were both interested in exploring. But the other thing that was kind of fun is Canadians don't play with history. Generally, like when I saw there was a movie called Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter, I'm like, what? <laughs> you, you can't say that. You can't put those words together. And of course you can. I mean, that that's one of the things that, that like that movie will reach somebody that a history book wouldn't reach. And so that person's going to get their history, just little tidbits from watching Simpsons and catching references to people from all over the world. You're going to get it through different ways. So we love the idea that there are just these little sprinklings, like a kid is going to read group of seven that would not have picked up those characters in a history textbook. And yeah, they know that jo poet John McRae doesn't fight some sort of zombie monster. They know that, but they might go and look up and say, okay, well, who was this guy really? Where, you know, what did he really do? And so it just puts the name out into the consciousness of, of readers and has a little bit of fun. And we kind of, we love the idea that the creative process and consuming history is an interaction. Like we get to play with these historical figures with respect and we learn about them in the process. And we kind of negotiate, okay, where, what's true, what's not. And obviously the things that happen in the book are not true. We say it as much, but those guys, those seven characters are all real. And they all really fought in world one at the same time. Some of them have real relationships outside of our story. Like in real life, they were, they were friends or interacted in some really coincidental and significant ways. Um, and we thought that was a, a really interesting thing that these people would be there. And our book features like these seven characters you know, a couple Nobel, no, future Nobel Prize winners, a prime minister, you know, the guy who discovers insulin, you know, famous Canadian artist, NHL hockey builder, like all these, all these very significant things. And it just like, oh, we're going to put them all kind of together in a, in a war origin kind of story. So that's, that's where it all started. And it was just tons of fun. Yeah. And we I, weren't I, aiming for like anything too gritty, just kind of uh, a l more lighthearted punch him up story. Yeah, no, I really, I really enjoyed the book. Definitely, like to me, like I, I was thinking like Howling Commandos, like Nick Fury, yeah. the Commandos was kind of like the vibe I, I got. And I like that you use historical figures. I think that's cool when people do that. I mean, like there's another book, Harriet Tubman, Demon Slayer. I don't know if you've ever heard of that comic book, but you know, like it, it to me, it's, it's interesting when you play with historical figures and put them in situations that they never were in. You know, it's just right. kind of a cool thing to do, you know? Um, I yeah, we, myth we mythologize the past, right? I mean, we, we tell stories of people from generations past and we make them into figures that are larger than life. Mm -hmm. And that is part of um, making them immortal is yeah. telling stories that push those boundaries. Like the Davy Crockett stuff. I mean, the Alamo, we know that that's a real place. We know that there is recorded history around those events. But when they portray it in a movie, there's liberties taken, yeah, right? Or wider, yes. wider, again, historical figure, uh, interesting and like tons of history recorded, put it in a movie and there are liberties taken. And I, I'm interested in those liberties, not for my own gain, but just for like, for a creative game. I think it's fascinating. It's very playful. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And, and uh, I think it's, I, like I said, I think it's cool what you're doing. I know there's another one coming out. You kind of teased it in the issues, of Peregrines. So I'm excited to read that. Yeah, can we see that cover? Here. I'm just trying to make sure the ring light, it's, it doesn't show up as bright in well, this you can printing. See, this is, you, there's that, and then we have another one actually coming out, which is a little clearer to see. Uh, we have two comics of Peregrines coming out, actually, like next week. Yeah, there's the Toronto Comic Arts Festival, like called TCAF, which is uh, one of the largest events of its kind. It's similar to like a small press expo in Maryland, SPX. And it's aesthetic, it's very local, it's incredibly diverse. Um, you know how like Maryland is situated, you know, around a lot of other 
big like there are big cities nearby within driving distance like yeah. toronto is the fourth or fifth largest metropolitan area in north america like after mexico city new york city la chicago and toronto you know competes with chicago in terms of size and scope so there are so many artists here so many comic creators here who are putting out really amazing work so tcaf just seems to attract the, the most interesting uh indie creators like if you love indie books you'd go there and you'd, you'd be broke so fast because i mean there's so much interesting stuff being made. So our stuff is debuting at TCAF, which starts at May 8th, which I think by the time this will drop, it'll be passed, which is totally fine. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we had a, a book ready to debut at the Toronto Comic Arts Festival. And Peregrines is like, um, it's a continuation from Group of Seven. So we're keeping the Group of Seven title as sort of now the larger kind of brand of, of our comic book making. So yeah. the next issue is issue seven, but it's a new story. For four issues, we're doing a, a new arc about four nurses on the front lines of world war one and they are undercover as spies because they would go unnoticed right i mean everyone so as bart simpson says uh no one ever suspects the butterfly yeah so uh <laughs> um, i don't know if you know that reference but anyway he was talking about reincarnation and he wanted to be reincarnated as a butterfly because no one would ever suspect that he's the one that burned the school down um because it was the butterfly <laughs> who, who would know so they're, um, you know, they are kind of like an unrecognized part of those war stories are all the women who volunteered and went overseas and tended to the wounded and the sick and risked their lives. So we wanted to tell an action adventure story with, with cool characters that can go uh, high flying on high flying adventures. And like, yeah, but they, at the, their day job is they have to still uh, take care of everyone else. So they are highly skilled. They're like masters of espionage and uh, and martial arts and all sorts of cool things. And uh, their adventure is definitely takes the group of seven thing like to one or two steps toward the uh, a more intense. And uh, it's a, it was artistically much more challenging for me in, in fun ways, too. So I, I'm so excited. And like the last pages are right there on the board. And it's uh, it's been absolute blast to draw issue seven or the first the first part of peregrines we're really really excited about it i mean i'm definitely excited uh to check it out after reading the book and and side note it's funny that you mentioned tcaf sbx i used to like want to go to san diego comic-con so bad and now i care more about going to tcaf and spx like to me that's like now the goal like san diego like i'm cool with that because i like comics san diego is like all pop culture it's it's yeah. something that's so far removed from like what it started as that like hearing about things like tcap and sbx like that's where i really want to like make my way I'm to blow your mind here first of all tcap has no corporate presence whatsoever so there there is no no warner brothers no dc no marvel no disney like they're not there they have no presence second thing is it's completely free <laughs> what it's it's a free event I don't have to wait five hours online in a virtual line to get tickets. No, yeah. no tickets. It's That's at, awesome. Toronto has a massive reference library in the heart of the downtown. And the reference library in years past, um, you know, for the last decade, has granted the Toronto Comic Arts Festival access to the library for that week or that weekend, I should say. And so the organizers have been able to keep costs incredibly low because they're not paying for space. It's like government funded space. So That's fucking crazy. They charge a minimal amount for just the administrative work of getting, you know, if you if you get accepted, it's a curated event. So you don't just, you know, sign up. You have to get chosen to to uh, exhibit your work there. And I mean, like for instance, this year, Jaime is one of the panel speakers. So like the kinds of people they can attract are at the highest levels of cartooning and of yeah. comics. And if, let's just say, Ed Brubaker, which he, he has come, if he comes, he's not talking about his run on Captain America or X-Men or Batman. He's talking about criminal or he's talking about reckless. You know, he's talking about his work that's just in, in more in the comics world than in the publishing world of mass, you know, big two or big three. Even though I know his stuff is at Image and it's considered big, but you know what I mean creators come there and they are really the spotlight is on their work not on the character that they are wrapping that someone else created 
everyone there is like doing their own stuff. So people, I don't know if you, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Jeff Lemire, like he's a staple that you'd see there. I love Jeff Lemire. And, I, I yeah. want to talk to him. So bad. like, he's like, he's right there, dude, at the very, like a very top of the list of like who I want to get yeah. on, the channel because I just love everything that he does. That dude he's special consistently fucking puts out some of the dopest comp- and he's got like five titles in the month, but they all hit well. It's, and I think that the reason too, like, I mean, I don't want to like gush about Lemire, but I think Go for it. I love him. That he'll focus on one book at a time. So it's not like he's writing five titles at a time. I've read, I, I think in interviews, that's why like, you don't see any title like, oh, this one's a little lagging this month because he'll just boom, knock out like this arc. Right. And then he focuses on the next title and oh, he's just such, he's just, I mean, he's a dope writer and a cartoonist. Like he does it all, you know? Yeah. He, no, he, he is really great that way. Um, I love hearing about his process too. Like how he, how he plans his day, how he'll spend his work day making his graphic novel pages yeah. of his graphic novel. And then spend his nights and weekends writing for other companies. So that's like his his second job is making books for Marvel, DC, I yeah. Image, etc. Dark Horse. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you know what? Like, as as much as Marvel and DC can like sometimes like just really play it safe or you know not really break boundaries as much as they should, I think. I have discovered a lot of people because, you know, Jeff Lemire wrote Green Arrow, right? Like, I didn't really know his stuff before that because I didn't check out Sweet Tooth. I, don't right. I think Sweet Tooth came out before. But, you know, that's that's the good thing about um, them writing for, for sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, Ed Brubaker, totally. I discovered also because I think he was, I don't remember which book I discovered him on. It might have been Batman back in the day that he wrote. Yeah. But then I went and checked out his other stuff and I... I love when they leave Marvel and DC. So do they. That's when you get the pure, the pure creative yeah. energy is when they're creating their own stuff. Like Scott Snyder not doing DC stuff right now, and he did Noctera. Like I, I'm really digging what he's doing with Noctera. And his American Vampire book is, is always like a staple for me too. Um, anyways, you were talking about your, you know, the new book. Like something that really stood out to me too. Like you draw traditionally, right? And is I do. And is that an ink wash that you're doing the black and whites with? Is that done traditional as well? It is for the most part. I'm I'm trying, you know, like when when we started, we knew that the budget for printing stuff in color was basically double printing things in black and white. And given that we didn't know how much money we were going to be able to make back, it seemed only to make sense that we'd work in black and white. And then it seemed to also kind of match the story, given that it's from black and white photographs. They kind of just went together from that era. So I started, I started trying to learn how to ink wash. And as you look through the first, you know, issue, the first chapter of group of seven to the end, you'll just see a, a change in how I, how I can make a space gray. Like in the first parts, you'll see bad brush strokes and like heavy handed, or I didn't know how to correct things. I didn't, I, I really like, didn't know what paper worked best with ink wash and what temperature my room needed to be all these sort of these little things that you pick up as you go now it's a, a much more um sorry to say much more fluid process more yeah. organic uh, a little more natural i'm you know learning new techniques every every time i make a new page so i've i kind of have a bit of a hybrid of digital and traditional because again i've acquired more tools more digital tools and more traditional tools so i have shifted for this issue my penciling is completely digital and it's minimal. It's like I, I map out a page and I, I keep it really, really stark. And then I print off that page because I, I got myself the big printer. Mm -hmm. So I print, I print off the page on Bristol in really, really light, just a tiny bit of ink on there, like 5% of it. So it's just only visible to my eye up close. And then I go right to inks on this piece of Bristol board that has basically guidelines as to where I want to draw. And I've shifted my thinking from like penciling and inking to just drawing with ink like the drawing is happening in ink so it's 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 a little bit more well if a it's faster i'm trying to like i i'm trying to hold to this idea that comics a page of comics should be done a day and there's a like you start a page in the morning you finish it at night and it's done as much as you can you do that you know i'm, I'm aiming for that so i uh i'm willing to say goodbye to a page at the end of a night and 
I, I think that the idea of like comics are or can be um, a medium of expediency. It can be something that is made knowing that I could over render, but I'm choosing not to. I'm choosing to say, what do I need to draw to communicate my idea to you? Do I need to draw more? How many words do I need in this sentence? Can I, can I get it down? Do I need mm -hmm. those extra ums and ahs and ums and ahs? Do I need to exaggerate to prove my point? So I'm trying not to exaggerate. I'm trying to pare things back. I'm looking at the artists who knock me over when I read their work. Like you mentioned, Mazet Kelly and Cook and Elsa Chartier and, uh, I, I, and Tim Sale. I'm like, oh, they're not doing extra. They are simplifying. You know, they're spending their time composing where the elements need to be on a page to make them as clear as possible. And I'm trying to be a student of that. So I'm, I'm trying to learn that stuff. I organize the page digitally and then I'm, I'm inking. So there are no more pencil lines, nothing to erase anymore, uh, which I love. But I, all my nice erasers are now a waste. My pencil sharpener, my beautiful electric pencil sharpener, I'm not using anymore very much. <laughs> so yeah, for this issue, I'm, I'm really a hybrid of traditional and, uh, and digital, but the, there is a, a physical art board. And once I scan it back in, I might do a couple touch-ups or you know, digitally darken or lighten an area that I think became unclear or I misjudged, you know, when it was, when it was, uh, on the, on the paper. So it's mostly, mostly traditional, but lettered digitally. I w I'd love to learn hand lettering. It's just another craft, like another thing you need to spend months practicing, yeah. but I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. I mean, I love hand lettering. I love seeing that in books. So I definitely am looking forward to seeing you do that. When can we, when, when were we going to be able to pick up the new issue? Peregrines was up for pre-order for all of April, and it is now up for just regular order. So okay. we're getting copies back from uh, the, from the printer in probably about ten days. Oh shit! Okay. And uh, we'll start shipping them out this month. So yeah, Peregrines is available on our website at www. Group of Seven. That's the number seven. I, okay. I should say this way: uh, Group of Seven. Ca and uh, sorry, Group of Seven Comics. Ca and you can pick it up there. We have really good rates of shipping to the States, which is, okay. which is nice. We, we ship up packages of the, the trade paperback and the new issue or just a new issue or a subscription to you know, more issues, like all four in the set, that kind of thing. And okay. uh, for our pre-sale stuff, we, every single person who got the, who ordered uh, our pre-sale, each issue comes with like a corner box style Peregrine's print, like a retro style print. Uh, it's, challenging to see there but anyway so which was a fun one for me to do i love corner box art each issue has a different uh, different one of the four peregrines is the the corner box art so it's kind of fun to do yeah that's dope yeah i kind of want to get it that's like one of the tattoos i want to get as a, a corner box i just i haven't decided like what character to do in it because I already have this whole arm is dedicated to comic books so nice i gotta get the right one you know um but yeah uh, you, I, do you like daredevil I love Daredevil. So there is a really dope one that it's like a modern version of the one of like him kind of standing there with the rings and someone okay. cleaned up the original one to make it like, a, it's just a beautiful graphic. You can just Google image search uh, Daredevil corner box. It, That's it, a good idea. It is so striking with the reds. Like it is it, so good. And there's so many great corner boxes. Don't yeah. do the heads. Don't do the seven No, heads. no, I would never do that. It's a waste. I love them from a nostalgic point of view, but they don't graphically look, they don't look great. Uh, I wouldn't do that on my arm either. You know what I mean? Or anywhere. Like that's, that's, I definitely want something a little bit more striking. Um, yeah. But definitely going to pre-order the book. I didn't, I didn't even know that the pre-order was already done. I am ashamed to say, uh, but I definitely want to pick up the new issue for sure. Uh, wrapping this up too, like I want to talk a little bit about the kayfabe ringside seats. You were a part of Image Grand Design. Well, yes. Yeah. People are including me. They're being really kind. They're including. I mean, me. I saw and your I, name I in the just, book. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I I asked Elena to put it in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm included, which is because of everyone's generosity. So, for the record, I drew one page, and that's cool. Craig, CK, you know, you know I met in person at an event. Same time, same day, I met Jerome Cabanatan. You know, two great guys, two local Southern Ontario guys. You know, we're the three of us are good friends. And uh, Craig said, you know, Jason, there's this image grand design thing happening. Come on the Zoom. Like, you know, it'll be good for you. You'll, you know, you get to meet some other people and good exposure for your book and everything like that. 
And when I got there, it was really clear that this was a, a complete passion project for so many people involved. I could hear when I'm you know, first meeting people like Eli Schwab and Rick Lopez, uh, I could hear that they were incredibly passionate about what they were doing. They felt, it seemed to me that they felt the way, they felt about image grand design, the way I did when I heard my friend Chris pitch me, Group of Seven, that I need to make this project. This needs mm. to happen. And with image grand design, I've said before, I'm on the record, I missed that. I wasn't there when image broke, when it, when it dropped, I should say, when it happened, I wasn't right. there. So though that era of comics does not have that spot in my heart that it really did for these guys. And I felt like it would be, I'd, I'd be a poser. Like I, it was, it'd be dishonest of me to get involved more than support in a supportive role. That being said, I, yeah, I drew some pages for image grand disaster that I didn't submit because it just didn't feel like, you know, it, I wasn't feeling it and that's mm -hmm. totally fine. I had, had a good uh, paper girls kind of story as they travel through the different key image books, um, which I thought was really fun. And I'm That's really glad I made those pages, but it, I, I didn't, it didn't feel like I, I was, it wasn't coming from a place of passion. It was coming from a place of like, kind of, you know, wanting to be included, which is not the way I want to think. So Ben Granoff, great cartoonist, you know, had his baby with his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, she had the baby with him, I should say. And, uh, <laughs> I think he was under the gun to get some stuff done. So he asked me if I would do a page, like one of his pages. It was already scripted and plotted, and whatever. I was like, yeah, no problem. I'll do that. Because as a friend asking for help, right. great. So I got my page done, submitted it on time. It's in the book. But I, I would not put me next to the names of the guys that put their heart and soul into it because it, it misrepresents or maybe it takes away from their real passion for the project. So I got to look at it kind of like from a supportive friend role. And it, like, I got to bear witness. I got to see everyone bring it together. I got to see who did the real heavy lifting. Yeah. I got to, I got to hear, you know, gossip, whatever, but I got to hear like the, the constructive arguments that went into putting that book together from a, a fly on the wall, friend in the room kind of point of view. And those guys are great guys. They're, they're creators doing heavy lifting solving problems the real way, like getting things done through cartooning and collaboration. And I, I can't give enough credit to, to the people that made that book. And I'm really happy that I kind of get to be part of it in, in a broad way, but I, I wouldn't want anyone thinking that I think that I'm, I'm one of the creators of the book. Cause I, again, it was more like bearing, like I got to be in the sidecar of the motorcycle. I okay. didn't drive. Okay. You know, I, didn't, All right. I didn't drive. It's great. I love seeing the energy and I love everyone's response to it. It's an awesome project and I'm, I'm really, I feel more proud of the people who made it than I do pride in making it. So, cause again, I just played that small role, right? But it's are cool. Gonna, Super cool. Are, are you going to be in any of the other projects coming up that are in the group? Good, good question. Only if I feel that passion, cause yeah. like you said about uh, indie books in general, you love the passion that creators have. So if I don't feel that, I'm not making anything unless you pay me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair uh, enough. You know, like, you know, money is a motivator. We can't, we can't lie. And if you get a commission, you want to do it. And, and it's, it's enticing and exciting to do. So are, there are a couple projects on the horizon. I'm really excited to make um, an article for Wizard 2. Nice, guys dude. Together. Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing an article too. I love being part of that. That's a really fun one. I have an idea that I have a passion for. So yeah, I want to do. Um, and there are a couple other things, you know, coming down the pipeline that I, I might, I might be involved in, but you know, everything is still depending on getting your real work done first. So yeah. I, I have to keep making more pages for Peregrines, the next three issues and uh, a few other fun projects on the side as well. So we'll see, we'll see whether, uh, what comes together. You, you can watch on the, yeah. Our ringside seats I know. like I, I do I, the post we see what happens and some things I jump on and some things I I let it, you know I I stay back because I again I I want everyone's work to be a, a work of passion so it, right. it that makes the best comics yeah dude I I definitely agree and um you know before we get out of here I want to thank you again for you know for chatting with me dude it's been a pleasure been a lot of fun talking comic books with you is there anything else that you want to tease that you got coming up besides this and then also where can everybody find you online social media all that stuff although all the links are going to be dropped down below thank you 
pleasure to be here. I'm really happy to talk comics with you. I'd love to to off the record, like come and brag with each other about what artist editions we have because it's so much fun to see those things and uh, and to go, oh my gosh, it's so cool. So that'd be fun to hear what you got back there. Things coming up really. Peregrines, the part one is out now, uh, which is issue seven of Group of Seven Comics. You can find that at groupofsevencomics.ca and any support is greatly appreciated. It's a really fun book and we're really proud of Peregrines. Uh, you can find me on social media on any of the platforms at Jason Lapidus. And you can also find us at Group of Seven and on Group of Seven Comics, pardon me, on, with the number seven on all social media as well. You should check out Chris Sanigan. He's the writer. Uh, he's a good, all around good dude. But yeah, that's, that's the best way to track us down. All right, cool, dude. Well, like I said, had a lot of fun talking comics with you. Same. I definitely want to do this again with you sometime, man. For sure, man. Good to talk to you. Nice to see you.